Uh, is it possible I can talk to the microphone? Can you be okay? Can you guys hear me pretty good? Everybody hear me good back there? Okay. Um, my name is Raj Mehta, like, like she mentioned, and I want to say how honored I am to be here in front of everyone. A uh, fan is my family. Okay, it's very important. Uh, Families Against Narcotics um, is a place that I can go to to share what I've been through. Um, for a long time, when I first got sober, I do all kinds of presentations at high schools and colleges, right? And I would do presentations on addiction. Um, what is addiction? Addiction prevention. I would not disclose my story. Okay? It isn't until I did my TED talk at U of M I disclosed my own personal story and, and, and kind of came out of the closet, as you could say. And the reason why I did that was because a couple moms, one mom and fan, and one woman named Jeannie Richards said, Raj, you gotta share your story. I said, I don't feel comfortable because I don't want people to be misled and think a certain way or view me a certain way. And they go, you gotta do it to fight the stigma. I'm like, all right. And I'm pretty smart. I listen to moms, not in the old days, but in my, in my recovery, right? <laughs> I'm pretty intelligent. I listen to moms and, and, I, and I began doing that. And uh, when I came out and began talking about, you know, who I am and what I've been through, um, I'm also a recovering heroin addict, okay, off the streets of Detroit, who, called, who crawled across the ghetto of, of broken glass to actually turn their lives around and become something in this world. Uh, I went on to graduate school at U of M Ann Arbor, graduated with a 4.0. I'm a master's level licensed therapist with the state of Michigan, and I'm a therapist and counselor. And I also do a thing called interventions. Did you ever seen a TV program oh, intervention yeah. before? <laughs> okay, so um, you might know that people that have a drug problem may not be very keen about the idea of having a drug problem. Is that making sense? Yeah. There's a term called denial for that. You want to hear this term called yeah. denial? So I meet with moms and dads all the time. And one of the things that I hear before I do an intervention for a family is they say explicitly, they're never going to rehab. Well. And so at that point, I can say, well, clearly this intervention will not work, and so nice to meet you and call it a day. So why do we not hear that? Why do we, as people that are trying to fight addiction, don't hear when someone says, I'm never going to rehab, I can never get clean? Why is that something we can't actually listen to? Yeah, Because it ties into stigma and it gets rid of hope. This is very important. There's a lot of pain in this room. I've lost people that are very close to me through addiction as well. And I lost my close friend and became the godfather of his son. I swear to you, if I could come in here and take all your pain for you, I would do it. I'd do it right now in a heartbeat. Um, but those that understand when you've lost someone that you really love and care about dearly to this disease, please use that as fuel for your fire. Be defiant, right? It's important that we realize that a heroin and an addiction bomb went off in our communities and everybody got knocked down. And so you look around, like a heroin bomb went off, like all these people have died and become addicted. You look in this room and why aren't the seats all filled? I mean, I want to thank and respect everybody for being here today, but there should be like 10,000 more people in this room. And not to be mean, I'm not judging anybody, but the reason why they aren't in this room is they don't have the courage that you guys have. And that's just a fact. You guys are the lions in our community. You guys are the people that are saying we're fed up. You know, it's, it's great to be a stakeholder. I can sit around and be a stakeholder, but showing up and suiting up is how you make this kind of change happen and addressing the issue and being honest that we're not gonna take it anymore. A heroin bomb went off in our communities and it's killing our kids. Think about the term community, the focus on common unity. What do we have in common with each other? Well, I always hear in America, the focus is on children. We don't want our children to have drug and alcohol problems. We want our children to live in safe schools. We want our children to be able to reach their full potential. Well, that being said, if children are very important to us, how do you think addiction feels about your children? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't wait to get his hands on them, right? Addiction is, is this killer that wants to destroy them. And by the way, like in a really bad movie with a demon in it, addiction wants to someone just kill your kid quickly, right? Addiction wants to drag this out and make the entire family cry, make everybody cry and suffer through the process. And that's why I respect and thank everybody for being here. Because just being here to talk about this and putting it out into the open reduces the stigma. We have to fight back. You know, the Zika virus is all over TV. Is that true, you seen the Zika yeah. virus? I'm you know, pretty intelligent now. How many people have died in America because of Zika? I'm sorry, was that, I was a lot of rock bands, I can't hear from you. That was how many people in America that died from Zika? Zero. And how much money do they want to spend to fight it? Billions. Right. Now, 
Before I go any further, I want the permission from this audience to be able to be honest and candid. Because to do my job properly, I have to be able to tell you guys some facts and information. And for some people, it's going to be kind of unsettling. But my goal is to promote harmony and healing. Everybody in this room deserves to be happy and be able to heal from what they've been through and their trauma and losing people and dealing with addiction firsthand. And so you guys have heard about this war we had in Afghanistan, right? A lot of things were dropped, a lot of bombs were dropped, a lot of money was spent. How much money do you think was spent just to rebuild roads and schools and buildings in Afghanistan during that eight year period? Eight billion. Right, so when I hear people that tell me that we don't have any money for rehab, it's like I hear people say, I'm not gonna go to rehab, I don't hear that. There's $8 billion we've spent to build them roads. God bless people in Afghanistan, but I got people that are dying trying to get into rehab, waiting, trying to get into rehab and dying and overdosing. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm sick of it. Uh, the veterans courts, those programs work. The sobriety courts, those programs work. Drug courts, those programs work. Being a licensed professional, I'm supposed to use called evidence-based practice, which means to go into this peer-reviewed journal, read all kinds of information, and say, this works and this doesn't work. So let's go in a different direction. What doesn't work in fighting addiction? Anybody have an idea what doesn't work? Locking people up and not giving them help or education. Is that amazing? I can lock people up for five years and 10 years and four years and eight months. <clears throat> when they come out, with, what are they gonna do? Oh, yeah. But why is that? What's that a function of? They don't have a method. Thank you, they don't have a method to stay sober. You gotta have a method. And so it's very important, your point is, there are many pathways to recovery. Don't anybody tell you otherwise. I bet people that honest to God got involved with their church and got rid of their heroin problem. Swear to God, it's true, Amen. right? I'm people that went to AA and got rid of their heroin problem. I'm guys that have an alcohol problem that went to NA and actually turned their lives around. People that go to therapy, education, healthy fitness, lifestyle. I don't mind how you do this. I don't make any money if you go to AA or NA, go to this church. I don't care how you achieve your goal. If you come into my office with tears in your eyes and say, I wanna stop using heroin, I'm gonna say that's fantastic. My next question is, how do you wanna do that? Yeah. And if you say, I don't know, then may I make a suggestion, right? And if you're jumping out of an airplane, I would happen to suggest that you pull that cord on that parachute, right? I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but I got some really good advice. Is, is that fair? Yeah. All right, so we're talking about this disease. And so the first thing we're talking about addiction, like how did we get here? How did we get a heroin problem in suburban America? Pills. <laughs> Can we be honest? Happened with pills. Now. I'm a lot older than lots of people that have addiction right now in the heroin world, right? So back when I was using heroin, may I be candid, everybody was a loser. In the late 80s, everybody was on parole from Jackson. They had armed robbery backgrounds. All the girls had been molested. They were all prostitutes. The guys were pimps and drug dealers, carried guns. Everybody was a complete loser, okay? And when you hung out with these people, you knew that they're all losers and crazy, and you're doing heroin, you got a needle in your arm, and there's all kinds of stigma and shame. And back then in the 80s, 80% 80 of people that started using heroin had never taken an opiate pill first. That's powerful. So people that got into heroin back then smoked some weed, drank some beer, and had a connection to somebody that did heroin. And so, by the way, if you had some mean intentions, you're trying to create addiction in your community, what would you do to, to, to a person to cause them to become a heroin addict? Let's go in the bad direction. What's the goal? Childhood, how should it be? Horrible childhood. Physical, mental, and sexual abuse, right? Let's throw in some poverty and some racism. What else can do cause damages to cause addiction? Lack of education. Lack of education. How about low self-esteem, low self-confidence, right? Let's also add in a genetic predisposition. How about that? Is that making sense? And so back then, the pathway to heroin addiction was being part of a deviant group of people. You knew you were all deviant, you were outsiders, you were outcasts, and that was part of that world. So what happened in the late 90s that changed the entire heroin game? Anybody have a theory on that? Yeah, one pill in particular from Purdue Pharma, a privately held corporation. They manufacture a pill called Oxycontin. And what did they do to get this pill all over the place? They didn't play by the rules anymore. What did they do? It was a Schedule II narcotic. They went to all these doctor's offices, especially in West Virginia, lots of coal miners, good insurance, 
lots of injuries, right? And what they say to the doctors? Not addictive. This is not as addictive and it has an anti-abuse mechanism. You can't abuse this pill. And they were convicted in federal court. They lied, made false graphs and false charts, right? And they got this drug being prescribed like crazy. Is that amazing? Yeah. They, I got it. so yeah, so we can camp on that. So the FDA has approved the use of oxycotton for people under the age of 18. I'm being very sarcastic right now because everybody knows how many little kids need some effing oxycotton, right? And their moms were crying, like, why can't you give my daughter some oxycotton? She's eight years old, her teeth pulled, and you're like, oh my god, you're so right. And so those benevolent people at Purdue Pharma said, we're going to get this approved for the ages of under 18. By the way, what's the goal to get people started on a drug before 18? Why is that an important goal? <laughs> you're grooming them and you're setting up for lifelong addiction, right? Because you're never going to forget that. That's called euphoric recall. When you're a 12-year-old kid and your mom hands you Oxycontin because your belly hurt, <clears throat> and you go, wow, mom, this pill really made my belly hurt go away. Right? That's all I'm saying. There was no reason to ever approve Oxycontin for under, under, under age of 18. We got morphine for that. We got Dilaudid for that. We even got fentanyl for that. That was a, a non-problem. Is that making sense, mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so Purdue Pharma changed the entire game. All of a sudden, we had all these pills available. And as that began to happen simultaneously, Vicodin like prescriptions went through the roof. So right now, America is 5% of the world's population, and we consume 99% of the world's Vicodin. That's amazing. And 8% of the world's Oxycontin. And so what happened in all these schools and high school kids and college kids who had sports injuries or had friends that had these pills, parents' medicine cabinets were filled with these pills, right? People began eating these Vicodins and these Oxys, right? But it's very important. The Mexican cartels did not have a secret laboratory and plan this whole thing out. What happened was over-prescribing, over-prescribing, over-prescribing. And then the DEA kind of began to put a little bit of their brakes on that. And all of a sudden, it's harder to get the pills, right? And where do people end up going to deal with their opiate addiction? Yeah, because bang per buck, heroin is so much more effective, right? Oxycontin is very expensive, about a dollar a milligram. Sometimes about $28,000 per ounce. And gold is what per ounce? Hmm. 1,200? <laughs> That's deep. So watch this. America always talks about value, right? Gold is our standard of wealth throughout the world. I can go anywhere in the world with gold and say, hey, can you realize what this is? They're like, yeah, that's valuable, right? So if the ounce of gold is $1,200 and an ounce of raw heroin is $7,000, what's that tell you about heroin and Oxycontin? Really, really valuable, right? And we're just being honest about that. And so all of a sudden we have all this over-prescribing, people from the suburbs going into the inner cities buying their drugs, right? And all of a sudden we had this opiate epidemic. And once again, because of stigma and shame, everyone went like this. Don't do that. Don't talk about it. It'll just go away. And so before you know it, we had a major problem. Who is this guy, El Chapo? Anybody hear about this guy, El Chapo? Oh, yeah. on TV. Yeah. You know like about El Chapo? From prison. Huh? He escaped from prison. He's a drug trafficker. Is he poor? <laughs> He's a billionaire. The first um, drug dealing billionaire was Pablo Escobar. You might have heard of him, the Medellin cartel. Yeah. And uh, they had a relationship, by the way. This was actually a connection to uh, Pablo over there. So um, our El Chapo is a billionaire drug dealer. They put him in Mexico's most maximum security prison. And what happened? He escaped. How? I don't know. Was this a regular tunnel? <laughs> no. It was a mile long tunnel, right? and it had a, a track in it and a motor scooter. And a tunnel cam kept, came up in his shower stall. When you realize, you know how hard it is to build a tunnel one mile long, and at the bottom of that tunnel go right into somebody's shower stall in a prison? What are the odds of that being so accurate? <coughs> Did anybody impressed by that tunnel? <laughs> right, can we all agree that no matter what kind of walls we build, <laughs> how many DEA agents we have, that the Mexican cartels can bring their drugs in as much as they want to? They can. can I prove a point? 1972 is when the war on drugs began under President Nixon, right? And so since 1972, the DEA has dedicated themselves to the supply side of drugs. They say, we will stop this stuff from coming in. Give us billions of dollars, we'll stop it from coming in. And so you look at evidence-based practice. Okay, what does the CIA say about the price of heroin and methamphetamine and cocaine since 1972? 
and adjusted for inflation, what's the truth? Good, Heroin is cheaper now, cocaine is cheaper now, meth is cheaper now than 1972. So our conclusion can be what about interdiction and the supply side prevention? Yeah. It doesn't work. Anyone want to guess how many employees uh, El Chapo has? We're impressed you throw a number out. 2,000. Huh? 2,000. 150,000 people in the world work for El Chapo. Oh Is that impressive? How many aunts and uncles and cousins and relatives do each one of those people have? Mexico is a narco state. Mexico is not a real country. It's a narco state controlled by a series of cartels that makes drugs for American drug users. 8% of all the drugs that come into America come from the Sinaloa drug cartel. El Chapo is in charge of that. Why does Raj want El Chapo dead? Well, it's very personal. Because El Chapo specializes in a very special kind of heroin, cut with fentanyl. Anybody ever hear about this heroin, cut with fentanyl? What's bad about this particular type? It kills everybody. And it's heartless. And someone said in a, in a meeting, they go, well, Raj, that doesn't make any sense. Why would a drug dealer sell the kind of heroin that kills people? That's a really bad business model. And I said, well, it would be in a normal world, but in a world where the consumers just keep lining up for more of it, and you don't care about killing people, it's not really a problem. But it is for me. I don't like that. That's unacceptable. At a certain point, we have to realize that these cartels are not going anywhere. They control the Mexican government. We're not going to stop this on the supply side. Is that making sense? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just being honest. 